Can everybody hear me? Yeah. The first scripture today is from Joshua 10, 7 to 15, verses 7 to 15. And the theme is the cosmos, I think. Um, so Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the fighting force with him, all the mighty warriors. The Lord said to Joshua, do not fear them, for I have handed them over to you. Not one of them shall stand before you. So Joshua came upon them suddenly, having marched up all night from Gilgal. And the Lord threw them into a panic before Israel, who inflicted a great slaughter on them at Gibeon, chased them by the way of the ascent of Beth Horon, and struck them down as far as Azekah and Machida. As they fled before Israel, while they were going down the slope of Beth Horon, the Lord threw down huge stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died because of the hailstones than the Israelites killed with the sword. On the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the Israelites, Joshua spoke to the Lord, and he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still at Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Iajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jashar? The sun stopped in mid-heaven, and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. There has been no day like it before or since, when the Lord heeded a human voice, for the Lord fought for Israel. Then Joshua returned, and all Israel with him, to the camp at Gilgal. And the second reading is from Psalm chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hid from its heat. And the third reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and we have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are, no means, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then, then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. There are the scriptures. Source 
of life and motion, complexity and change, of matter and energies both dark and light, grant us this season the will to seek you throughout the boundless, vibrant universe that incarnates you, to find, to welcome, and to love you wherever you show up. Amen. Amen. I am honored to be here at First Church this morning among dear friends and colleagues and neighbors to walk with you a while as you make your way to that wooden shed in Bethlehem. It's a funny thing if you think about it. We all know what's going to happen. He gets born every year. <laughs> and yet there we go once again, trekking back to the manger to go see for ourselves. So it's not just a story we're telling, not just an annual recitation of something amazing that happened long ago. It's also happening in real time by means of our commemoration of it. By marking this time, waiting, watching, and finally welcoming, we make God's presence among us real again, renewing our life together as we enact these yearly rituals. What I'd like to ask today is how we might attend to these two different nodes of space-time at once, the one 2,000 years ago in which a single child was born in an occupied land across the seas to wonderstruck, horrified parents under a single brilliant star. And the other right here and now, which is to say, when you go home this afternoon, right there and then, the real time and space in which we are told God is again appearing. I'd like us to try to keep both of these spaces open so that we resist the impulse to think Advent is simply commemorative, that God only showed up over there, back then, one day, far away, and that we attend to what we might call the real-time incarnation, God's presence in a world that looks almost nothing like it did back then over there, socially, politically, culturally, musically, economically, technologically, or even, and this is your focus, this Advent, cosmologically. We are a long way from that single bright star. Taken together, today's readings sketch a loosely biblical cosmology. That is, they tell us a bit about what the authors of scripture thought the universe looked like. The earth, understood sometimes as a sphere and sometimes as a flat disk, occupied the center of the cosmos, with the sun, planets, and other stars rotating on progressively distant spheres around it. The universe, in other words, looked like one of those European nesting dolls, with a ring of stars on the outside and the Earth resting calmly at the center. And of course, the whole thing was understood to have been created and regulated by a God outside the world, whose praises the celestial bodies sing, the heavens are telling the glory of God, says Psalm 19, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. You'll hear the vocal imagery here. It's as if, the psalm says, the stars were constantly praising their God. Of course, we cannot hear stars. The next verses admit that their speech is no speech, and their voice is not heard. Yet, the psalm insists their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Gazing from anywhere in the world at the stars, we hear them silently yet ceaselessly praising the one who transcends them. Thus, St. Augustine scans the whole world in the fourth century, looking for his God, asking the sea, then the air, then the sun, moon, and stars, tell me something about my God, to which they answer in chorus, he made us. The beauty of the night sky, then, was thought to lie not so much in itself, but rather in its capacity to point beyond itself to God, to rouse the wondering mind to awed contemplation of the divinity above and beyond the whole world. God's external regulation of the cosmos can be detected in the psalm's next verse, 
which pictures the sun as running a course God has prepared for it, bursting each day from that little tent God made for it, and returning there at the end of its sprint across the skies. The book of Joshua similarly puts God in charge of the cosmic bodies, when it tells us God commanded the sun to stand still for a full extra day, giving the Israelites sufficient time to demolish the Amorites in battle. In both of these cases, the biblical authors clearly want to establish God's supremacy over the great lights in the sky, most likely in the face of their ancient Near Eastern rivals, who believed God to be, for example, the sun. To the Babylonians, Egyptians, Greeks, and indeed the Amorites, who seem to have worshipped Sumerian gods. The texts essentially say, our God is better than your gods. In fact, our God created your gods. He controls, he made tents for them, right? And he can stop them dead in their tracks if he wants to, to secure the victory of his people. In short, don't mess with our God. If the stars of the Hebrew Bible point beyond themselves to a transcendent creator, the star of Matthew 2 points below itself to an imminent redeemer. The wise men follow a particularly bright star until they find the place where the child was. Notice there's no manger in Matthew. Our nativity scenes tend to smush together the sheep and angels and manger set up for Luke with the star of Bethlehem in Matthew. But either way, the direction of our theological vision is becoming transformed. The impulse to look and listen beyond the stars for this God is in this story redirected to an invitation to seek God below them, among us. Contemporary astronomers suggest that the particularly bright star of Matthew 2 could have been Jupiter, or a close conjunction of Jupiter and Venus, or a supernova, or any number of other astral phenomena, depending on the actual dates of King Herod's reign. There's some controversy here. As you may know, the monk who made the calendar, an ironically named guy whose title translates variously as uh, Dennis the Humble, Dennis the Small, uh, and Denny the Dwarf. <laughs> Dennis, who was so small and humble that he gave the Christian world the calendar, it would eventually spread throughout the globe, that guy, uh, seems to have been off by a few years. Jesus wasn't born in some hypothetical year zero or one CE but rather somewhere between the years 7 and 2 BCE. And he probably wasn't born in December, but that's okay. We get the idea. Jesus of Nazareth was born under a starry sky, made particularly bright by some super luminous something. In this New Testament scene, as in those from the Hebrew Bible, we've still got an earth under the watchful eye of one brilliant cosmic body, whether sun or star, telling us to find God both beyond and within the world. As you've probably heard, however, it turns out that the sun is a star, and that the earth, far from sitting still at the center of things, both rotates and revolves around its star. This de-centering of our planet somehow still offends our biblical sensibilities, which tend to keep assuring us that all that is for us here. And in fact, one of the pieces of evidence marshaled against the Copernican view of the cosmos in the 16th and 17th centuries was the book of Joshua. If scripture says the sun stood still, then the sun must move around a motionless earth, not the other way around. Eventually, of course, the church relented and agreed that the earth moves around a motionless sun. But since then, the insults to our privileged place in the cosmos have come faster and more furious. Not only is the earth not at rest, but the sun isn't either, rotating as part of the vast spiral dance of our galaxy so that everything is in motion, nothing just stays put. Our sun is nowhere near the center of this galaxy, but on the exurban outskirts of things, just one of billions of stars in the galaxy, potentially orbited by planets like ours. How many billions of stars? Well, estimates range between 100 and 400 billion stars. Somewhere between 100 and 400 billion, which is to say there are 300 billion stars
stars we can't quite account for. <laughs> and this is just in our galaxy. There are, God help us, more, not just a few more, but swarms of more, bazillions of galaxies, each of them containing anywhere between 100 million and 100 trillion stars, each of them not only rotating spirally, but also racing away from each other as the universe accelerates its expansion under the force of a newly detected substance called dark energy, which seems to make up about three quarters of the universe. But other than that, we have next to no idea what it is. And to make matters more imponderable, it's looking like there's no end to this spiraling swarm of runaway galaxies in a growing cosmic void. According to the most widely accepted theory of cosmology, called inflation, it looks like the universe might well be infinite. Which is to say, the galactic multitude beyond us spins and swarms and races outward forever. And just in case we had a shred of grounding left, it seems that the processes that produced this infinite universe, with its scadzillions of galaxies, each with their millions or trillions of stars, that these processes are even as we speak producing other universes. Which is to say our whole universe might just be a negligible bubble in an infinite sea of infinite universes that they're now calling the multiverse. And if there is such a thing as the multiverse, if universes beyond our own multiply forever throughout infinite space and time, then it may feel difficult to get too excited about our little nativity scene with its sleep-addled shepherds and sweet little star. And we know that God doesn't make the sun stand still for Israel, America, or anybody else. Does anyone believe, asks the poet Annie Dillard, that the galaxies exist to add splendor to the night sky over Bethlehem? <coughs> well, certainly some people do. It will always be possible to insist that somehow, despite these millions and trillions of infinite infinities, we are still God's only conscious creation. So that however cosmically exurban we might be, we're still the only ones made in the image of God. The ones for whom God showed up once in all the infinite infinities of space-time in 7 or 2 BCE in occupied Judea. We will always be able to decide to limit the scope of the incarnation this way, and to say, just once, just there, right then. But then it's hard to shut out that nagging voice, asking, seriously, all that out there forever racing and spinning for us? And so if we cling to our limited view of the incarnation, we end up torn between religion and science. The more the astronomers tell us, the harder it is to hold on to our star. But if we think again about what stars tend to do in scripture, we'll remember that they point past themselves, both above and beneath, to a God who is at once beyond the reaches of our most crazed imaginations and right there in the midst of things. For some of the philosophers I spend admittedly too much time with, the capacity to oh, they're crazy. The capacity <laughs> to hold hope in both of these spaces at once, to see them through one another, is called wonder. For them, wonder is not daydreaming or thoughtless astonishment, but an active, restless attention to the way that extraordinary stuff appears in the everyday, with all of the shock, amazement, and terror such appearances inspire. Caught between the amazing grace of the manger and the awful grandeur of the multiverse, perhaps the answer is not to reject one in favor of the other, but to wonder at the shock of their conflation, all that is suddenly there in the form of a single child conceived by an unwed mother. And if we are to be true to our wondering, true to our infinite creation, and to the divine power both within and beyond it, then perhaps we should let ourselves attend to the other spaces God is showing up, both above and below us. My colleague Meredith Hughes will be walking us after the service through some of the cosmic immensities surrounding us, and then back we will go to our laundry and Walmart, <laughs> to trying to figure out which bulb is out on the string of white lights that you just bought last year, they don't make things as well as they used to. So we live somewhere between the laundry and the multiverse.